Well, because it's a new year, I'm assuming still only in January, I thought, um, might take a fresh look at the cross this morning. Amen? Because the cross is the centre focus of our faith. Without the cross, we wouldn't have salvation, we wouldn't be here. So I just thought, still only January, new year ahead of us, let's go back and look at the cross. And I'm going to read a few verses out of 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18 to the end of the chapter. <clears throat> Talks about the cross here, and this is what I want to look at. So 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and reading from verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us who are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Had not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Verse 22. <clears throat> For the Jews require a sign, <clears throat> and the Greeks seek after <coughs> wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jew a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than man, and the weakness of God is stronger than man. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, nor many nobles are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God had chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. And these things of the world and things which are despised had God chosen, yea, the things which are not to bring not the things that are, that no flesh shall glory in his presence. But to him ye are in Christ, Jesus, whom of God is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Or he that boasts, let him boast in the Lord. <coughs> so what Paul is talking to the Corinthians about in chapter 1, he's confronting the Corinthians about the cross. And if you read verses, or well, the last chapter of 1 Corinthians, it talks about the dead, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So he begins Corinthians with confronting them with the cross, and he ends the first Corinthians with the victory that we get from the cross. When the cross is preached, signs and wonders followed the preaching of the cross. You can read that in Acts chapter 2. And when the cross is preached, things should happen in our lives. <coughs> what should happen when the cross is preached? People should be set free from sin. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Chains should fall off. Diseases and sickness <coughs> should vanish. Habits are broken. <coughs> Addictions are gone. Temptations are overcome, bondages broken, and yokes destroyed. That's what happened in the book of Acts when Paul preached the cross. And the reason why that happens is because on the cross Jesus died and rose again and is alive. And the victory we have today comes from the cross, because from the cross we get a risen saviour. That's what we're singing about. And because Jesus is alive, that gives us the hope and the victory over all these things that try to trap us and bring us down. 
But Paul says in verse 18, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us who are saved, it is the power of God. Why are so many churches empty today? Why are so many churches with empty pews? The answer is that the preaching of the cross and what I'm sharing this morning to most people is foolish. That's why. It's foolish. It's out of date. It's a waste of time. And we don't think the cross is sufficient. And that is why people have abandoned church, because people don't understand the power of the cross and what it has achieved. And therefore churches are empty today. But when Paul goes to Corinth, he confronts this, these people with the cross. Let me give you a little bit of background to Corinth. The word Corinth actually means ornament. If I went to any of your houses, or you went to mine, over the fireplace, you would have a mantelpiece and you have ornaments on it. Maybe you went to Connemara on your summer holidays and you bought back a little thatched cottage about that size, you know. If you turn it upside down, it says made in China, going <laughs> down, like everything else. And it's on the ornament. Or maybe you went to Paris and somebody brought you a little ornament of Eiffel Tower or you went to New York when you got some ornament. And our, our, our lives can be cluttered with ornaments from different things, and we all have them. And so the word Corinth actually means ornament. Now, Paul went to Corinth on his second missionary journey, and he went as a tent maker and a missionary. And it just happened when he was there, he bumped into Priscilla and Aquila, who had been kicked out of Rome because Claudius wanted all Jews out of Rome. So they go to Corinth, and they're tent makers. The chances are they met in the synagogue, I presume that's what happened, and as a result of that, they planted a church in Corinth. But Corinth was a very worldly city. The world was just all around them, full of the world. In fact, in Bible days, if you call somebody a Corinthian, you were calling them a very bad person. That's what the word actually meant. And in Corinth, there was temples all over the city. There was a temple to Apollo and Neptune and Zeus and Aesculapius and Aphrodite. All of the temples <coughs> were all over the city. So you could go from one temple into the next. It's not by accident that when Paul writes to the Corinthians, he says, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit because they were surrounded <coughs> with all these temples everywhere you looked. There were three groups of people in Corinth. They were the pagans. And these were the people who went to all these temples and worshipped all these idols. That's what they did. Pagans were everywhere. The second group of people in Corinth were the Jews. They weren't pagans because they went to the synagogue and they followed, they believed in God. Abraham, Isaac, God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, they believed in the law. And then you had philosophers. Now philosophers are people who are very intelligent and they want to know all about life. What is life? Why are we here? Who created us? What happens to us when we die? Why are we, what is the reason for our existence? And in Athens you had Aristotle and Plato, these were all the great philosophers. And the Greeks love to debate philosophy, the reason for life. So you had these three groups of people in Corinth. You had the pagans who went into all these temples and followed all these pagan gods. You had the Jews who went to the synagogue and worshipped the one true God of Israel. And then you had the philosophers who debated the origins and the meaning of life. And all of a sudden, one day, here comes Paul, a missionary, a tent maker into the city. And everybody's trying to work out, well, Paul, who are you? What is your message? And Paul's message is, I preach Christ and him crucified. Now, to these people, this is a very strange message. Because what Paul is saying to the Corinthians, and this is true today, of course, 
that salvation is not found in earthly wisdom or going into all these temples, you will not find salvation. Salvation is not found in going into the synagogue and reading the law, which we have in our Old Testament. That just points you to Jesus. But salvation is not found in the law, in theology, and salvation is not found in winning an argument. I'm a better philosopher than you, and I know more, and I'm wiser than you. Salvation is found in the cross. I preach Christ and him crucified. Whether you're a pagan, whether you're a Jew, or you're a highly educated Greek philosopher and you know too much. <laughs> Salvation is found in the cross. So Paul's message is very, very simple. But look at what it says in verse 18. For the preaching of the cross to them that perish is foolishness but unto us who are saved, it is the power of God. In verse 18, there are four interesting words. The first word we see is perishing. Perishing are people that are perishing. In other words, they're going to go to hell when they die, if they don't know Jesus. That's the perishing. That's the first word we see in, in, in 18. But then we see another word which is very closely linked to it, which is foolish. So we see the perishing and we see the word foolish. The next thing we see is the power of God and we see the saved. So in that verse, that verse 18 separates everybody in the world. Two groups of people in the world there is the foolish people who will perish and there is the saved people who believe in God. That verse separates everything. Whether you're a pagan, whether you're a Jewish rabbi, whether you're a Greek philosopher, that doesn't matter. Are you saved or are you lost? Do you believe in God for salvation or are you believing in some foolish philosophy? That's a very powerful verse. For the preaching of the cross, to them that perish, that is foolish. But to you and me who are saved, it's the power of God. But unto us who are saved, it is the power of God. The perishing don't understand the cross. That's why these churches are in fall. Because the perishing do not have the spirit within them to bring them to the cross. The things of the spirit are foolish to them. The people who are perishing because they don't have the cross. And the reality is you end up in hell. And when you end up in hell, you will realize how foolish I am for not believing in the cross. But of course then it's too late, isn't it? That's why today is a day of grace. Tomorrow is too late. Let me give you the story of Noah's Ark. Think about this for a minute. Here we have a man called Noah, and he's building a ship in the middle of a desert. The people would have looked at Noah and said, there's something wrong up here. This guy is a bit foolish. I'm sure people must have went to Noah and said, Noah, <clears throat> Noah, how are you going to get this ship from the desert all the way into the sea. Wouldn't that be the most logical thing you would say? But of course, you knew Noah's answer would be, well, actually, the sea's coming to me and you. There's going to be a flood. So Noah built his ark in the middle of a desert. And people must have said, that is foolish. But when Noah and his family went into that ark and the door was closed, and it began to rain. They were in the ark. They, Noah and his family were saved, but the people outside had perished. It was too late. So what, if you read verse 18, you could say this. For the building of Noah's ark, to them that perish is foolish, but unto Noah and his family, it is the power of God to save them. 
That's, which, that's how you could read verse 18, if you want to put in to Noah's Ark story. Now, as I said, in Corinth, at the time of Paul, you had these people. Look at verse 20. It says, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is their disputer or the philosopher? Had not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Now, here we have three groups of people. First of all, we have the wise people. People who are wise. You ever hear the story of the rich young ruler? He was very wise. He pulled down his barns and he built bigger ones so he could store more grain. That was very wise, very clever. He's doing really, really well. He's prospering. He's doing what he thinks is a great job. But what the rich young ruler didn't realise was he mistaked his Bible for his bank account. A lot of people do that today. Never get them mixed up. That's where he went wrong. He mixed up the two. He was wise in earthly wisdom, but he was foolish on the long term because he lost his soul. So what Paul is saying to the Corinthians, where are these wise people in Corinth? The second group of people is the scribes. He's, he talks about the scribes. These were Jews in the synagogue who, a scribe wasn't just somebody who wrote down the law and kept the old, these were like counsellors. You would go to the scribes in a matter of debate over uh, if there was a problem with the law, if you had a problem with your other neighbour, they were like judges. Where are these people? They know the law, they understand the law, they are trying to keep the law, but they don't know Jesus. And they don't want to know anything about the cross. We don't want to know anything about that. And then he says, where is the philosophers? These are people who like to debate all about God. They like to talk about God. They like to have this big intellectual conversation about God. But they don't actually know God. And what Paul is saying to these three groups of people, the wise earthly man the scribes and the philosophers, what Paul is saying is, God has made foolish your wisdom compared to the cross. So these are all very intelligent people, but they don't understand the cross. Let me read you verses 22 and 23. He continues on this story. In verse 22 he says, the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek for wisdom. Here comes Paul. But we preach Christ crucified. On to the Jew, a stumbling block, and on to the Greek, foolishness. Now it says here that the Jews required a sign. Now, what the Jews actually believed in was the first five books of the Bible is called the Torah, which is the word teaching. And what the Jews believed is that if you keep the first five books of the Bible, which is called the law, you keep that, then you're a good person and you will work your way to heaven because you are keeping the law. But the interesting thing is that if you study those first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, that in those five books, you see the sign of the cross. In those five books, you see Jesus' plan to save everybody. Let me, let me give you an example. When you read the book of Genesis, you're going to come across Noah's Ark. I already talked about it. What is Noah's Ark about? It's all about a wooden ship, the people go inside, and inside that ship, that boat, they are saved. And the people outside, they have perished. Now think about this, that we have a wooden cross, Jesus dies. By the way, eight people came out of Noah's Ark, and eight is the sign of a new covenant. So when you read the story of Noah's Ark, you can see salvation in that story. It's a type 
and a shadow of the cross. When you come to the book of Exodus, which is the second book in the Bible, the Jews are in slavery in Egypt. How are they going to get out of slavery? Well, Moses tells, God tells Moses to kill a lamb, and you put the blood on the doorpost, you put some blood up here on this side, and it's actually the shape of a cross. And then the angel of death went over, and those who were under the blood of the lamb, they were saved, and they escaped. And of course, Jesus is who? He is the Passover lamb who died on the cross. When you get to the book of Leviticus, once a year, the high priest would get this goat, it was called the scapegoat, and he would lay his hands on the head of the scapegoat, and all the sins of Israel were put onto that goat. And that goat was led into the desert, and they pushed him off a cliff, and he died. And when he died, he carried the sins of Israel for that year, and he died. Can you see Jesus there? Jesus is a scapegoat. He died in our place. That's why Hebrew says that the blood of bulls and goats is not sufficient. So in Leviticus, we have a scapegoat. When you come to the book of Numbers, the children of Israel are in the wilderness, and they're being bitten by snakes. God goes to Moses, what am I going to do? And God said to Moses, put a pole up on that hill with a serpent on it, and when people look at that serpent on the pole, they will be healed. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, should ever believe in him, shall not perish, but have everlasting life. We all know, what's John 3, 14? As Moses lifted up the serpent of the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up. See, that pole was a shadow of a type and shadow of the cross. The bronze serpent, bronze in the Bible is a symbol of God's judgment. He's going to judge that serpent. And when you look to the cross, you will be healed. They were healed. So in the book of Numbers, we see the cross. And when you get to the book of Deuteronomy, if you killed a man by accident or you done something wrong, you could run to what was called the city of refuge. And once you went into the city of refuge, you are now safe from the people who wanted to kill you. So in the book of Deuteronomy, we see the cross because the cross is our refuge. We were singing about that. So when you go to the book of Genesis, Noah's Ark is a sign of the cross. When you go to the book of Exodus, the Passover lamb is a sign of the cross. When you go to the book of Leviticus, the scapegoat was pointing a sign to the cross. In the book of Numbers, that serpent on the pole was a sign of the cross. And in the book of Deuteronomy, the city of refuge, once you got into that city, you were safe. Once you come to the cross, you were safe. You are free from your sins. It was a sign of the cross. So the Jews demand a sign. That's what it says here in verse 22. They require a sign. Paul is telling the Jews, you've got the sign. Read your Bible. It's all about Jesus. When Jesus was on this earth, they said to Jesus, we will follow you if you give us a sign. Give us a sign, Jesus, and we'll follow you. What did Jesus say? The only sign you're going to get is the sign of Jonah, who was in the belly of a whale for three days and three nights. That sign was already there, but they didn't read their Bibles properly. They read the story of Jonah. Do you know what Jonah said when he was in the belly of a whale? In Sheol, he said these words, salvation comes from the Lord. Wow. You Jews, Paul is saying to the Corinthians that in the synagogue, you have all the signs that you need. But they didn't accept them. When Jesus rode that donkey into Jerusalem and he went into the temple and he took out a whip and he started to beat the Jews out of the temple, they rejected him. They put him on trial before Pilate. And when he was in trial, the crowds shouted, crucify him, crucify him. What they actually said in Aramaic was this, I know crucify him, that's our English. They said, send him to the cross. Send him to the cross. Send him to the cross. You see, what the Jews wanted was a ruler 
who would kick out the Romans and establish the Messianic kingdom. But what the Jews got was a Messiah riding a donkey into Jerusalem, whipping his own people. To the Jews, Jesus and the cross, that's foolish. How can we accept salvation in the cross? A number of years ago, somebody said to Billy Graham, you're the greatest evangelist in the world. Why don't you go to Jerusalem or Israel and preach the cross to the Jewish people? Because you're such a great evangelist. And they looked into it. And eventually they got a letter back from Israel which said this. Billy Graham, you are welcome to come to Israel and preach. We'll actually give you a football stadium in Tel Aviv to preach. Can you imagine? Wow. But then it said this, one condition, do not mention the name Jesus. Okay? So Billy Graham didn't go because salvation is found in no other name but the name of Jesus. So he couldn't go. You see, the cross is a stumbling block to the Jews. But the cross is also a stumbling block to people today. You see, good people don't need the cross. Good people today in Ireland will say, well, you know, you, you, you believe that in, the, in Jesus died on the cross. Well, I, I actually believe that too, but I've never actually come to that repentance, that new birth experience that you're talking about. You see, good people understand the cross, that Jesus died on the cross, but don't, don't actually come to that saving knowledge of repentance because they're too good. And if you go into a lot of good people's houses today, on the mantelpiece, beside that little cottage you got from the west of Ireland, or that little Eiffel Tower you got from Paris, you'll probably see a cross. And people put cross, we have a cross in our house, and that's fine. But to most people in Ireland, the cross is an ornament. It looks good on the wall, on the mantelpiece, with the thatched cottage and the little or ornaments. That's all it is. And they have some knowledge that, yeah, Jesus died on the cross. It's an ornament. And that's what it has turned into. If you trust in something else other than the cross for salvation, that means the cross has become a stumbling block. And it's that stumbling block, the cross, which is the only thing that can save you. Not saying there's nothing wrong with having a cross on your mantelpiece. We have one because we believe in it. But the cross only works when you acknowledge that you're a sinner, that you need to repent at the foot of the cross and experience the new birth. But you'll find today a lot of people know about the cross, but it's just an ornament. It's just part of the religious paraphernalia of people's lives. It's a stumbling block, not just to the Jews, but to religious people as well. He goes on to say that the Greeks seek after wisdom. As I said, the Greeks love to debate about God. They loved having debates with Paul. Paul, when Paul was in Athens, he went to Marsh Hill and he, he had great debates with the religious philosophers of the day. And every couple of years in Athens, there would be a new philosopher, a new idea about God, a new idea about everything. And it changed all the time. You know, the Bible says that heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall never fail. Philosophers and their ideas come and go, according to the seasons and the times, but the word of God endures forever. The cross has stood the test of time. Today, people have their philosophy. They talk about God. And people talk about God, and you can have great conversations with people about God, but they don't have the personal relationship with God. That is the difference. The Bible doesn't debate the existence of God. The Bible says that God exists. How does the Bible begin? In the beginning, God. All you have to do is add faith. But the Greeks love to talk 
about God. It reminds me of Nicodemus. I know he wasn't a Greek. But remember one day Nicodemus went to Jesus at night time. And he said to Jesus, how can I be born again? Look at me, Jesus. I'm probably 60 years of age, probably a big fat belly. And, you know, I can't go into my mother's womb. My mother's probably dead and be born again. You see, what Nicodemus was doing is he was looking at the whole thing of being born again in the natural. It was natural. That's what he said. And of course, Jesus said to him, you cannot enter the kingdom of, of heaven unless you're born of water and the spirit. And Jesus went on to say these, I have spoken to you about earthly things and you don't understand. How will you believe if I speak to you about heavenly things? So that's the Greeks. What You see, the Jews rejected Christ because they cannot come to terms that their Messiah would ride a donkey into the city and be crucified and die on a cross. To the Jews, that's a stumbling block. So the Jews rejected Christ because of the cross. The Greeks rejected Christ because they couldn't understand, not the cross, but how could anybody rise from the dead? To them, that doesn't make sense. So both the Greeks and the Jews rejected Christ in Paul's day. And the answer to that problem is in verse 24. This is what it says. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. So what Paul is saying to Jews and Greeks, that you both need to understand what the cross is and who God is. What Jesus has done on that cross. Now verses 26 to 31, Paul goes on to say, verse 27, But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confront the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. And then he gives a list of the people that he chooses. God chose noble-born people. These are people of high standard in the society. But God also choo chose foolish people. He chose weak people, lonely people, and despised people. Look at the people that God has chosen to reveal the cross. And you and me are in that category. And when you read the Bible, you would be surprised at the sort of people that God has chosen to reveal the message of the cross and salvation. Think of Moses. He's abandoned. There he is floating down the river Nile, picked up by Pharaoh's daughter, and becomes the, I was going to say the hero, but the leader in the story of Exodus. You think of somebody like David, who's the seventh son of Jesse, you know, the, the least of all his sons. Only a shepherd boy. And yet God raised up David to fight Goliath. And you know the story of David and Goliath. And David becomes Israel's greatest king. You think of somebody like Ruth. By the way, Ruth was a Moabite. She was a pagan. She was not a Jew. <clears throat> she is living in Moab, which is a very pagan country. And to make a long story short, she has to go back with her family, Naomi, to Bethlehem. She marries Boaz, and she becomes part of the royal line. And from Boaz and Ruth would eventually come Jesus. Who would have thought that Ruth? You think of somebody like Jacob, who was a trickster, a bit of a gangster. There's plenty of them around today, isn't there? But the Bible says, I'm not ashamed to call him Israel. He changed his name. You think of Rahab the prostitute, a prostitute. She believed God and God used her. You think of Gideon, that poor, timid little farmer, and he becomes a leader in Israel. Or you think of Peter, who denied Jesus three times. And on the day of Pentecost, he preached, and 3,000 people got saved. What if these people all got in common? They all had faith. They all believed somewhere along the line that there's a God, that there's the cross, that there's redemption, that there's more, that it's not foolish to live your life for God. 
And this chapter ends, or the, comes to an end in verse 29, yeah. that God did all this so that no flesh shall glory in my presence. When you look at the lives of all those people and how, how messed up their lives were, God turned their lives right around so that they could not say, I did it in my strength. I did it because I'm great. I did it because I'm some wonderful, gifted person. All of these people, Moses, David, Ruth, Jacob, Rachel, more, Peter, they all had to give the glory to God because in themselves they had nothing to give. Paul is saying to the Corinthian church, his message is very, very simple. I like reading that verse again where it says, verse 23, but we preach Christ crucified. That's Paul's message to Corinth, and that's my message to the Cotill Christian Fellowship today. I want to preach Christ crucified. There was a church in England, you might have heard this story before, I don't know how true it is, but it's an interesting story. And on the wall outside, they had a sign up, we preach Christ crucified, which is 1 Corinthians, verse 22. But as the years went by, ivy grew over the word crucified. And when you read the sign, it said, we preach Christ. But as time went by, the word Christ was covered in ivy. And all of a sudden, you go to this church, we preach. We preach prosperity. We preach how to be happy. We preach a message that makes everyone happy and joy. We don't preach Christ, we don't preach Christ crucified. And if you don't, you're getting into very, very dangerous territory. Paul was not highly educated, he spoke ordinary, common, Koine Greek, but his message was very simple. What is the cross? What is Christ crucified? What does that mean? Three things. We are all sinners and we deserve to die. Number two, God sent his son and he died in my place. Number three, if you repent and you believe in that finished work of the cross, you are saved. You can't get any simpler than that. So whether you're a pagan and you're going into all these temples or whether you're a Jew going to the synagogue <clears throat> or whether you're a philosopher and you want to understand all these wonderful stories about life, the cross is very, very simple. You're a sinner, you deserve to die. God sent his son, he died in your place. If you repent, believe in the finished work of Christ, you will be saved. The cross is the answer to sin. The cross shows you and me God's love. The cross shows us the path that you and me must follow. Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. Last but not least, the cross is not an ornament. It is the power of God unto salvation. Amen. Amen. Father God, as I bring this meeting to a close, I pray, Lord, that verse 18 would ring in our ears. That the preaching of the cross to them that perish is foolishness, but unto us who are saved, it is the power of God. And I pray, Lord, that in this church we preach Christ crucified. We thank you for the cross. That is the answer to our sin. It shows us God's love, the path we must follow. And I pray every day we will take up our cross and follow you. In Jesus' name, amen.